For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Welcome to the 10th annual Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication presented by Climate One. This award is generously underwritten by Tom Burns, Nora Machado, and Mike Haas. We'd like to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the comments of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our podcast drops every Friday, and you can subscribe wherever you get your pods. I'm delighted to welcome two world-class scholars of climate communication and public opinion who are superb communicators in their own right. Tony Lizerwitz is director of the senior and senior research scientist at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Ed Maybach is director of the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication. Over the next hour, we're going to have a conversation about what Americans think and feel about climate disruption, how to talk with people who see it differently, understanding climate as a human health matter, and much more. We begin with a remembrance of Dr. Schneider by Alison Salerno. The late Dr. Stephen Schneider was a pioneer, not just as a climate scientist, but as a skilled communicator who could reach the general public in a way most scientists couldn't. The media is focusing on the boxing match, which is, you know, uh, protect the environment versus the economy when it's actually a false frame. Schneider didn't shy away from controversies and pushed back against traditional expectations that scientists shouldn't be advocates, even for a cause as threatening as climate change. Dr. Jane Lubchenco is a marine biologist and world-renowned environmental scientist. She met Dr. Schneider when the two of them were both awarded MacArthur Genius Grants, and they became fast friends. It often seemed like he felt his mission on Earth was to convert the world. He positively loved engaging with people about climate change. And he was equally adept at making complex science accessible to non-scientists, patiently explaining very tricky bits, but also very skilled at confronting climate deniers, pointing out with great delight their flaws in their logic or their factual errors. Schneider's dedication to climate science and facts inspired other prominent scientists to be more public with their findings. His blunt talk often made him the target of industry efforts to discredit him. He pioneered the idea that scientists should do their work and then present it to a wide public audience, even if that meant getting into messy political debates. Climate scientist Dr. Catherine Hayhoe explains that before Schneider, most academic scientists were loath to interact with the public. They'd seen what had happened to Carl Sagan, the American astronomer and science communicator who had paid a price for popularizing science. He was never elected to the National Academy, even though his credentials were on par with many who were. Steve was really instrumental in breaking that stereotype. Again, not just for younger scientists who followed in his footsteps like me, but for his peers. Schneider became the first member of the Climate One Advisory Council in 2008. And a year later, he came to Climate One on the day he published his book, aptly named Science as a Contact Sport. He died unexpectedly in the summer of 2010. Following his death, Climate One created the Stephen H. Schneider Award to honor his work and contributions to the field. 
Hayhoe says Schneider's influence continues to this day. I just think that his legacy is really hard to even encapsulate because it's like you'd have to survey almost every scientist who does public engagement on climate change in the U.S. and North America and really the world. And if you did that, I feel like you would see this picture that, of his influence that's it's, it's like a foundation. It's like it's spread out underneath what hundreds of people are doing today. Underneath those efforts, you have Steve. Schneider's tireless efforts inspired a generation of climate scientists to leave the comfort of their lab and join the arena of public policy and informed communication. At a time of political divisiveness and urgent need for climate action, his message and enduring legacy are more important than ever. Welcome to you both. Uh, Tony Leiserwitz, you worked with Steve Schneider when you were just out of college. How did he treat you and how did he treat climate deniers who hurled venomous questions at him in public presentations? Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, it's just great to be here and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, you know, what Catherine Hayhoe just said is exactly right. I mean, not only did he have such a huge influence on climate scientists, he, so many of us, he touched us personally. I mean, I was just a kid of like 22 years old and ended up uh, being a staff member at the Aspen Global Change Institute, where Steve was a board member. And I worked with him for four years. And not only was it just a pleasure to learn climate science from him and all of the peers that we would bring to Aspen, but he took interest in me as a snotty-nosed 22-year-old. Uh, he treated me the same way I saw him treat world leaders, uh, you know, other scientists and others uh, around the world, and took a real interest in me and was actually a mentor and is, in fact, one of the reasons why I'm standing here today. Uh, he inspired me to not only devote myself to the issue of climate change, but more specifically to devote myself to this question of communicating, uh, which is absolutely so critical and is uh, you know, one of the strongest legacies of Steve's life. Ed Maybach, you tried to meet uh, Steve Schneider once unsuccessfully, but say you surfed in his wake. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, actually, um, I happened to be in Madison, Wisconsin one night with some time on my hand and, and strolling down Main Street. Uh, I saw that Steve was speaking, so I went in, was absolutely dazzled by his talk, tried to jump into line to talk with him, and uh, was was eclipsed by dozens of others who, who got there first. So um, certainly the instinct was there. I saw, I had a chance to see him do what he does and clearly can feel how he inspired so many people. But when I came to the climate community about 14 years ago, the one thing that I found is that virtually everyone who welcomed me into this community as a public health professional, every one of them once I got to know them a bit, every one of them had been influenced by Steve. So um, when I said to you last week that I, I've been surfing in his wake ever since I, I joined the community of, of concerned citizens who are working on climate change, um, it really is, is the case. I'm, I'm one, I feel one handshake away from Steve through virtually everyone I know. Well, this award to you uh, today is equally fitting because as Catherine Hayhoe said, Richard, everybody's been touched by Steve directly or indirectly. And in the climate field. I think the similar can be said of your work uh, on the Six Americas, the research work that you've done really is the gold standard. And I think you two similarly have uh, uh, certainly informed my work uh, for the last 14 years and, and a, a vast amount of others who work in communication and, and draw from it. So this is a particularly uh, fitting moment. Um, many people think of climate change in a binary way. You accept it or deny it. Tony Leiserwitz, explain global warming six Americas and how those attitudes have changed in recent years. Sure. So when Ed and I started doing this research together over a dozen years ago, uh, believe that or not, Ed, uh, we very quickly understood that, you know, uh, Americans don't have a single viewpoint on climate change. And then, as you just said, Greg, too many people then would divide the world up into believers and deniers. And that's way too simplistic. And in the course of our first surveys together, we identified what we call global warming six Americas, six different segments of the, of the public that each respond to this issue in very different ways. So very quickly, uh, they range in a spectrum from a group we call the alarmed, uh, that was about 26% of the country in our last national survey. These are people who are fully convinced it's happening, it's human caused, it's urgent. They're eager to know what can they do to get involved. Then comes a group we call the concerned. That's also about 28%. These are people who also think it's happening and human caused and serious, 
but often think of it still as kind of distant in time and space. So they would support action, but they don't yet see why it's urgent. Then comes a group that we call the cautious. It's about 20%. These are people who say, ah, I'm not really sure. Is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it serious or is it kind of overblown? They're still on the fence. Then comes a smaller group that we call the disengaged, about 7%. These are people who basically say, I don't know anything about this issue. I don't know what the causes or the consequences or solutions are. It's not like ideological barriers. They just don't really have even a, a basic understanding of the issue. Then a group we call the doubtful. This is 11%. Uh, these are people who say, you know, I don't think it's real. But if it is, it's natural. Just, you know, natural cycles. Nothing that humans have anything to do with. Nothing we can do much about. So they don't see it as much of a risk. And then last but not least is a group that we call the dismissive. And as of our last uh, study in April, that was 7% of the country. These are people who are firmly convinced it's not happening. It's not human caused. It's not a serious problem. And many of whom quite literally tell us that they're conspiracy theorists. They say it's a hoax. It's scientists making up data. It's a UN plot to take away American sovereignty and many other such types of narratives. The last thing just to say, because they get way more attention than they deserve in terms of the proportion of the public, they're only 7%, but they're a really loud 7%. They're really vocal 7%. They have tended to dominate much of the public square, in particular because they're very well represented in the current White House and in the halls of Congress. So they have tended to actually intimidate much of the rest of the country into climate silence. And so one of the main messages that I think has come out of our research is not just understanding that these different audiences exist and you need to meet them where they are, not where you are, where each of they are to help them engage this issue from their starting point, but also not letting the dismissive, who again are this tiny slice of the country, intimidate the rest of us into silence. Right, and I hear so many people in conversations that those deniers would just, you know, flip or change, then everything would kind of, you know, it would open up. It's just, and there is, they definitely get a disproportionate amount of the attention, not only uh, from people in, in other parts of the categories. Ed Maybach, you know, how has that changed over time? Five years ago, how many people were alarmed, concerned versus now? What, where's, where's, which way are people moving on this spectrum? Yeah, that's the really great part of the story. So five, six years ago, the alarm segment, the doubtful and the dismissive on the opposite end of the continuum, they were all about 12 or 13% of the public. Um, over the ensuing five or six years, there's been this enormous migration of people from the middle of the spectrum, mostly the, the cautious and the concerned, moving into the alarmed category. So as Tony said, now it's, you know, the alarmed are between a, a quarter and 30% of the public, which is, that makes them the largest single segment. Of, of Americans are, as their name implies, they're alarmed about climate change. They understand we've got a problem and they're beginning to take actions to align with solutions. And conversely, on the other end of the continuum, the, dis the doubtful and dismissive segment, something happened that maybe we might not have anticipated. And that is those two segments contracted right now. Uh, so we've, we've essentially seen a shrinkage of the uh, members of the dismissive segment by, you know, depending on, on which wave of the survey we're looking at, which wave of data, by at, at least a third, if not a half. And that's really remarkable. That's something that I, I personally wouldn't have predicted because once people have made up their mind, it's really difficult to change their minds. And most members of the, the that's kind of the, the sine qua non of being in the dismissive segment. They, they feel really convinced based on what they have heard, the, trust, the, the trusted voices that they listen to, they were convinced that climate change was not a real serious problem. And the, the term uh, denier is thrown around a lot and it's very charged term. When do you use the term denier? Ed made that. Yeah, thanks for that question, Greg. Um, I actually use it only in a very special circumstance. I, I use the term denier because it is so emotionally loaded and it, and it creates really strong reactions in people. So I reserve that term for people who are paid essentially to sow, to sow doubt, create uh, confusion, uh, put out misinformation about climate change. Those people, I think they really have earned the term denier. Um, conversely, members of the dismissive and the doubtful segment, I don't ever call them deniers because I don't feel that's fair to them. To me, those people are victims. They're victims of a, a, a sustained 
incredibly well-funded, incredibly disciplined misinformation campaign that's been going on for decades. Um, and even uh, I would suggest that all of us are victims of that misinformation campaign. And when we look at our own thought processes, what, how we see the issue of climate change, we will un all undoubtedly find ideas that were suggested to us by essentially um, opponents of climate action, people who have used their, their fiscal and, and other resources to try to shape the way we think about this issue. Tony Lizerowitz, let's discuss the partisan dimensions of climate. What did you learn when you geolocated people and asked them about heat waves? So a study we did a number of years ago is, well, let me, I guess the broader point is that I, to state the obvious perhaps is that climate change has become a very politically polarized issue. So, you know, as a general theme, Democrats are much more engaged with this issue and Republicans much less so. I, I should quickly say, though, there are plenty of Republicans who do think that climate change is real and a serious problem and, and in fact, are even rolling their sleeves up. So I don't mean to turn this into some sort of black and white thing. It's not the case. Um, but there is clearly a partisan divide. Um, and we did a study a number of years ago where we actually were interested, well, what happens when people actually start experiencing record setting heat waves? And so what we were able to do is we were able to take our survey respondents and geolocate them. In other words, try to see what was the closest weather station to their, where they actually live and they took the survey. And then we could see, had they experienced, for instance, a record heat wave? And what we found very interestingly is that peop that uh, Democrats who had, in fact, we knew instrumentally had experienced a heat wave were more likely to say, yes, they had experienced a heat wave. Uh, Republicans were actually less likely to say that they had experienced a heat wave, even when the thermometers told us that they had. And that's just one of many, many kinds of things that we've discovered over the years of how sometimes that for those few people who are really ideologically driven by this uh, issue, it can shape and color the way they interpret even their own direct experience. And so say a little more about that, like how, you know, like who, we know that uh, political affiliation is the top predictor of how people are going to, uh, you know, perceive climate. So what's going on there? Is it like tribal, like I, I believe what people around me believe, the, the sort of the, the social norms, the, the, the group that I belong to believes this way, so I'm going to believe it too. Feel that back a little bit. Yeah, of course. So there's a famous phrase by a political scientist named Aaron Waldowski who once said, most people don't know much about most things, okay? And that's all of us to be truthful, right? I mean, I happen to know a lot, a lot about climate change because I've been in this field for over 30 years, but you ask me to assess the risks and hazards of say nanotechnology, I'm probably not that much better than just every, every, every other person. So the fact is, is that we all live in this world of hazards and risks and potential threats all around us. So we all generally don't have the background to really do that, to really investigate that, which means that we have to look to guided and trusted people to help us navigate this complex landscape. And so uh, one of the places that people look, other than say scientists, who they generally don't hear very much from, unfortunately, scientists don't have a huge megaphone, um, is that they look to their political leaders because the political leaders are the ones that have been talking about climate change. And then we call this the effect of political elite cues, which is just a fancy way of saying that when leaders lead, followers follow. And of course, unfortunately, we've seen this playing out in a compressed, distilled, and very sped up fashion in this country right now around COVID and mask wearing, right? Uh, when, um, when the CDC first said uh, masks should be uh, worn, we actually were doing a survey right then on COVID and we found a huge spike it, literally within 24 hours of the CDC saying that. That was before the president and many others started to, uh, from the Republican party started to denigrate the idea of wearing masks and even framing wearing a mask as somehow an insult to one's freedom. They politicize that issue. And now you've seen, of course, mask wearing dramatically decrease among their followers. So these things are playing out in real time all around us as we speak. Ed Maybach, for 21 years, you've lived next door to a woman who frequently describes herself as a Goldwater Republican. Tell us about the time she wandered into your kitchen while book club was meeting in your home. 
Okay, so I have to admit, when for the first 10 years, she would always remind me that she was a Goldwater Republican. And I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what that meant to her. I could tell it, it had something to do with the fact that she saw me as a San Francisco liberal, a, probably a Nancy Pelosi liberal. Um, but once I understood what it meant, I realized, okay, she just feels a real need to keep my views at arm's length from her views because she felt threatened by them. And I, I didn't push her because she wasn't ready to, to engage in any meaningful conversation. She was clearly pushing me back as a neighbor in a friendly way saying, I don't want to talk politics with you. I definitely don't want to talk climate change with you. But she's a member of my wife's book club. And she came, she was in my home one night when I came home from work. I was in the kitchen having dinner by myself. She wandered in. And I remembered that once she mentioned to me, she was a vegan. And I kind of put together the disconnect between veganism, at least my perception of veganism, and being a Goldwater Republican. So I asked her about it. I said, Nancy, I've, I've outed her. Nancy, why, why is it that, uh, you know, what's your motivation behind being a, a vegan? And, and she went into it at quite a large, at quite some depth. Um, and she was really passionate about the whole thing. And it, for her, it really came down to her love for and compassion for animals. She just couldn't conscience killing animals to feed herself. And after listening, after having the opportunity to actually have a real conversation with me, she started to ask me about climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and she really I had a whole lot of questions. She really did want to know. But until we actually had a, a real meeting of the minds, a real trusting moment, there, there was no way she was going to let down her guard to actually explore any of that with me. And at the end of that conversation, which probably lasted 30 or 40 minutes, she essentially summer, uh, ended the conversation by saying, well, I probably got to get back to the book conversation. But thank you for that. that I really feel like I understand climate change for the first time. Wow, what a moment. And, and, and having known the person for 10 years, I, you know, I think there's some, some um, sort of transferable principles there about listening first. You say that, uh, Ed, that trying to persuade people to change their minds is a fool's errand and only engage when invited. So what are some sort of principles from that moment that other people could uh, apply in their lives about when to engage, when invited, those sorts of things? Well, I have to say the first one of the first principles of communication is ask questions, right? Because <laughs> communication is supposed to be a dialogue, not a monologue. Um, and I can't think of a single instance where I've ever succeeded to persuade anybody of anything unless they were really interested. They wanted to know what I had to say and and considered what I had to say in their in their decision making process. So unless the, the door is open, um, don't bother. Uh, it, it just, it's as it, which connects to why I was so surprised, as I said a moment ago, so surprised that we've seen this contraction among the, the number of the dismissive segment. Um, so clearly they are, many of them are finding ways to have conversations with people who know the truth, who might not know much of many of the facts, but at least have the, the correct sense that, wow, climate change is a real problem. Um, as Tony suggested earlier, it's a problem that more and more Americans are coming to see, uh, co coming home to roost in their backyard and they're recognizing it as such. And so perhaps the reason why the dismissive segment is shrinking in size is because out there in America across the, you know, the back fence or, or at the, uh, you know, on, on people's stoop, they're having conversations whereby they're actually, people are actually asking questions and listening to one another's responses. This is Climate One, and we're talking about climate communication and American public attitude with Ed Maybach, director of the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, and Tony Leiserwitz, director and senior research scientist with the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Tony, psychologist Paul Slovic was your primary dissertation advisor and a pioneer in understanding how humans perceive risk. In one study, his research showed a people a photo of a seven-year-old girl dying of starvation and asked for a donation to help her. He then showed two children and then larger groups. He found that humans are less likely to respond emotionally as the number of victims increases. He said, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off, he recently told the Washington Post. Sometimes the more who die, the less we care. What does that mean for the human response to COVID and climate? 
Yeah, so Paul, did. Uh, he's done the whole series of very fundamental pieces of work, and I encourage all listeners to go check out his, uh, his body of work. But this one in particular, I, I mean, there's a famous phrase that's long been attributed to Stalin, that the death of a single individual is a tragedy, but the death of a million is a statistic, okay? That as human beings, we're just not well built to understand and really understand the meaning of these large numbers that each one of which, of course, is an individual story. You know, the hundreds of thousands of people who have died of COVID in this country in just the past nine months, I can say that, but you can't really understand that that is not just the loss of an entire life, but the ripple effects that has had in tearing apart the fabric of families and communities and little leagues and, you know, workplaces and so on and so forth. I mean, Annie Dillard, the wonderful writer, once said, you know, this is all really easy. Just take yourself, all of your trials, your tribulations, your joys, your sorrows, your angers, and so on, and multiply it times seven and a half billion if you want to understand the world, right? It's easy. Of course, it's not easy, right? We can't, we just can't compute it in that way. So why that then translates to climate change is because so much of climate discourse has been at this very abstract numerical level in no small part, because the only way we know about climate change is that it came out of the scientific community, which talks in the language of numbers and abstraction. And in fact, climate change itself is an abstraction. You cannot directly experience global climate change by yourself, right? You literally can't. You can experience specific impacts, but you cannot experience what's going on around the entire world in the ice, in the oceans, in the biosphere, in the atmosphere. That only happens, we only know about it because scientists have been collecting hundreds of thousands of measurements all over the world for decades, okay? That's how we can we understand what climate change is. Um, so that's very difficult in itself to translate into people's you know, de into their bones to touch not just their heads, but their hearts and ultimately affect what they do with their hands. Um, and that I think has been one of the real challenges for climate change that fortunately through research that Ed and I and many of our colleagues around the country have been doing is beginning to find that one of the ways that you do that is that you tell stories for all of our great innovations. I mean, we are living in the most technological age and we are talking to each other by Zoom right now and over the radio waves and on television and social media. I mean, these incredible inventions. And yet still the most powerful form of communication we have is what we relied on when we were still huddled around fires in the stone age. And that's telling stories, telling and, and, and sharing experiences from one person to the next. Don't eat that berry someone in our tribe ate that berry and died. You don't want to do that, okay? And through that simple story, you have just changed somebody's life. You've probably saved their life, okay? So story is absolutely crucial to our being able to understand this. And that ultimately, not saying this is about polar bears or abstract future generations, but us, okay? It's affecting people right here, right now, it's not just in our backyards anymore. It's not even in the front yard, it's in the basement. So how do you help people understand that? And one of the most powerful ways to communicate that is through story. And it sort of turns on its head. One of the common themes of, of people who talk about climate change is to talk about its scale as though the scale itself will, will drive home the urgency. And I, what I'm learning from you is, is actually flipping that. The scale, people can't grok you know, mass extinction, the six max extinction. I, I don't know. I, this, I do this for a living. I can't get my head around that. What I'm hearing you say is humanize it, make it personal. You do that with your Climate Connections uh, series on, on radio. Uh, Ed Maybach, uh, your research in indicates that hope is on the wane. Explain what that's, what's going on there. Well, we can only guess what's going on there, but I think we've all lived to it for the past four years. We've, we've <laughs> lived to an administration who has not only failed to rise to the challenge of climate change, they have run in the wrong direction as fast as they possibly can. So those of us who are concerned about climate change, it, it makes sense that we are starting to see a, a decline in the feeling of hope about our future. And the reason why that's important, um, our research has shown that people who feel more hopeful are more likely to be taking actions, a variety of actions that are likely to be helpful, including the most important action, which as far as I'm concerned, um, that is taking political action. 
And, and we know that people who are more hopeful, who are keeping hope, their hope alive, are more likely to be taking a variety of different actions that ultimately will help us move towards solutions. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I am hopeful that uh, we are in a moment uh, of a, a rebirth of hope, morning in America, if you will, um, uh, in a very different way, perhaps probably the first time we actually will have a federal government who is really going to focus on um, asking and answering the question, what can we do to, um, to promote, to develop climate solutions? What can we do to become a climate ready nation? And that's a, a really exciting moment for me. Just before our conversation today, I, I got off a uh, I'm part of the, my university's sustainability council, organized only in the last six months, um, both people who work on our facilities on campus, as well as people who create our curriculum, and, and people who do research like, like Tony and I. Um, and what I saw happening among our, our leaders in sustainability at George Mason was so inspiring. It, we've taken the work uh, to an entirely different, an entirely higher level than it's ever been to in the past. Um, and I can't really explain why, but I, I'm, I, I suspect it is tied to that feeling of hopefulness. We're all seeing an opportunity um, present itself or a series of opportunities present themselves that haven't really been there for the past number of years. And, and to, to keep hope alive, people are stepping in and starting to innovate in really helpful ways. Tony Larzowitz, uh, some people don't like to talk about or avoid talking about climate because it's depressing, but you say that cynicism is more destructive than depression in the climate frame. Explain more about that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll just say personally, I, look, I've been doing this work for 30 years and I've been watching this problem get worse and worse for 30 years. We, mm -hmm. The science has been clear for literally a generation plus of what was going to happen. We filled in a lot of the details. I mean, there's still need for more science, of course, uh, climate science, but the broad outlines were very clear decades ago. And you know, it's tough to work in this field and to work on this topic when you see everything that was projected uh, when I was just a young man coming to fruition and in sometimes the most personal ways. I mean, I had a, a, a eureka moment when I was in Aspen uh, one day after one of these really uh, big meetings where I was just up in the mountains uh, trying to relax. And suddenly it hit me that what I would, had been learning about, for instance, sea level rise, you know, wiping entire island nations off the map was going to happen right there in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, where the warming temperatures are going to wipe the, some of my favorite ecosystems, the tundra zone, these incredibly tough yet fragile ecosystems right off the top of these mountains. And moreover, it was going to affect the entire landscape and ecosystem around there. And now when I've gone back to Colorado, I see it. The the pine bark beetle and the fires and the droughts and so on. It, it, it's, I'm living exactly what we were talking about uh, 20 years uh, earlier. So I find that, look, if you're in this field, you're probably oscillating from, you know, despair to hope and back and forth. And sometimes within the space of just a couple minutes. Um, and so I'm you, actually- How do you cope with that grief? How, when, you, when you have that, when you're in those down cycles, do you try to push it away? Or Because I think some people that I, you and I, I learned from some of the same psychologists that pushing yeah. away that grief only makes it grow, but it's, it's, not, it's hard to kind of succumb to it because you're afraid it's gonna swallow us up. Absolutely, I think it's, the other, it's one of the other forms of climate denial is not truly letting yourself as best you can feel, and you use the word grok, to really understand in your bones what is happening and what's at risk um, and, uh, and what we're losing, literally while we're speaking here right now. Um, I think it's really important to embrace that, to dig deep into it and let yourself fully feel it and then turn that, uh, that sadness, that despair, that anger into action. That's the best possible uh, way to deal with that. Um, what worries me, back to your prior question, is the people that have, and I think we live in an in a increasingly cynical age, and I find that very destructive. Because if you adopt the position of the cynic, um, then suddenly action becomes impossible. Like, nothing's ever going to change because politicians suck, right? Uh, nothing's ever going to change because companies won't ever change. Um, 
uh, to quote Henry Ford, uh, he once said, uh, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. If you don't believe you can make a difference, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you won't even try. And I would much rather take that, that fear, that anger, that despair, and turn it into something constructive and say, I at least did everything I could to make a difference. And maybe back, do you allow yourself to totally uh, give in to the grief and I don't know, curl up in a ball in a fetal position on the floor sometimes? Was that to me? I'm sorry. Fred, Fred. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, right. I came to this work from the field of public health. I had worked on some really difficult problems, difficult both in terms of public health and in terms of the emotions they bring up, like the HIV epidemic in, in the, the late 1980s, for example. That was a really tough problem. And uh, But when I once I finally really had connected the implications of climate change to public health and human well-being, I, I really I could barely bring myself to think about it. Uh, it was, it made me so emotional. Um, I don't know, the grief was what I was experiencing. I'm not sure that I had uh, given in to the belief that there, that this was not uh, a problem, that, that this was a problem we could manage. Um, but it was, it did raise a lot of negative feelings. And pretty quickly, I learned how to manage that in a really productive way. I'd sort of lock it into a metal box and I'd only open it up when I felt the need to, uh, to re-motivate myself. But instead, I would focus on the work that Tony and I were doing and that I was doing with other people. And I would make that my benchmark of progress because this is a problem that, that I'm going to be working on for the rest of my life. I'm quite sure Tony's going to be working on it for the rest of his life. Um, it's entirely possible that our children and our grandchildren will be working on it for the uh, duration of their lives. This is a problem for the long term. Um, but in order to manage to get up each day and give it our best, the way I manage that is by looking at the progress that we are making in our in our work. Um, and that is a very hopeful um, way to, to manage the sort of the, all the difficult emotions and channel them into real motivation for, for getting up, doing our best. We're recording this episode of Climate One with a live stream with a live online audience. And we have one question from Coney Kogan about doomsters, whether their approach is harmful toward uh, fighting the, the dangers of human caused climate change. There's been quite a debate out there. David Wallace Wells wrote some very, there's some books out there and some people say, oh, don't, don't say how bad it is because you might scare people. Uh, Tony Weiseritz, where do you come down on doomsters? Is it possible to be too dark or too real? So I think there's a spectrum here. So first of all, um, there for a long time, I'm going to talk about broad terms about climate communication. For a long time, climate communicators were essentially using a kind of, let's call it a doom and gloom message. Like let's scare people into action. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet one of the things that Ed and I, and Ed really helped introduce me to these deeper concepts because I came from the field of risk perception. Uh, Ed brought into this as well, the importance of the field of what's called efficacy. So efficacy refers to a huge body of scientific literature that has found that it's not enough to fully understand the risk, the threat that you face. You also need to essentially know what the solutions are, okay? If you hear that you've been given a terminal or a, a cancer diagnosis, you wanna know what can I do, right? What can we do? Um, and you need both of those, both the threat and the sense that there are things that can be done, that you have the ability to do those things, and that if you take those actions, it will make a difference. So that has led lots of people to suddenly say, okay, we need to communicate about the solutions. Some people have taken that pendulum, I would argue, too far the other direction and just saying, let's only talk about solutions and not talk about the scary stuff of climate change. I think that's also as a general principle, not correct. It, you, in the end, you need people to see both sides of this, that this is a real threat. That's why we're so focused on it. It's why it's, action is so urgent. But at the same time, it's vitally important to give people a clear sense of what they can do as individuals, and even more importantly, what we can do collectively together as communities, as cities, as states, as the nation, as the world. Um, and then what you find, of course, is that you get a few people who are out there like the dismissive who are saying this isn't a problem at all. And then you get a few people on the other end who say we're doomed, like this is over, like it, forget about trying to do anything, right? It's too late. I, I have very little uh, 
patients with either of those extremes. I think neither one of those is particularly helpful and frankly are not just not borne out by the science. And I think you know many of the prior winners who have been scientists have made this case much more clearly than I'm going to. But th that's not what the science says. The biggest source of uncertainty in the fork in the outcome of climate change is not in the climate models or in the effects of the climate system. It's human beings. It's our decisions. It's our choices. It's our behavior. This is within our control, not to stop climate change. I think it's too late for that. But we can absolutely limit it to relatively manageable levels. Okay. Yes, there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering, even if in the best of case circumstances, but that's a mile away from the worst case uh, uh, circumstances that will ensue if we continue on the current path of CO2 emission. So we, have an we can make such an enormous difference. And that's why I get really frustrated by the people uh, on either extreme who say either this isn't a real problem still, uh, or who take the opposite tack and say it's all too late. And another question from a listener watching the live stream as we record this episode of Climate One, uh, Sally Bingham asks, um, who are the deniers spreading the misinformation? And some other people are asking, is it about money? Is it about power? Ed Maybach, you know, that 7%, you said they have this outsized influence. What are their, do we know about their motivations? Is it money? Is it power spreading this misinformation? Ed Maybach. It's it's complicated. There's no, there's no simple answer to that question, but, but I think it began with being about money. It began with the fossil fuel industry wanting to protect their business interests. Um, and they are incredibly smart in the way they have gone about protecting those business interests, including buying friends, buying friends in think tanks, buying friends in elected uh, in politics. Um, and uh, so while those friends aren't necessarily defending the financial interests, at least they don't see themselves as defending the financial interests of, of the fossil fuel industry as their primary reason for contesting the, the reality or the seriousness of climate change, once, once we, <laughs> people, people are incredibly capable of lying to themselves, of persuading themselves. Well, earlier I said it's very difficult to persuade other people. It's pretty easy to persuade ourselves. And once we do persuade ourselves of a point of view, we have a tendency to find all kinds of reasons why we were right to adopt that point of view. So in answer to Sally's question, it, you know, it really does. There's all kinds of different layers of human psychology that are built on the most fundamental layer of, of economics, the economics of the fossil fuel industry, which until now has absolutely seen this climate change and climate responding to climate change as an existential threat to their industry. I think we're beginning to see some of the fossil fuel companies as realizing they have the capability of actually evolving what business they're in, away from being a fossil fuel company and towards being an energy company. And when, once you decide we're gonna become an energy company, the best energy that can be produced, the best energy that we can produce, it creates a pathway for them to, to essentially renounce all of this ridiculous um, climate denial that they have supported for so long and embrace the business opportunities of, of the clean energy revolution. If I could just add one thing to what Tony said a moment ago um, about the, what we continue to learn from climate science, the most hopeful thing that I have learned recently from climate science is that the latest view is that once we do achieve decarbonization of the global energy supply, which is clearly gonna be 10 or 20 years, uh, hopefully not longer than 20 years from now, um, the warming of the climate system will stabilize pretty quickly. In other words, the, 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 the emergent consensus based on the models is that runaway climate change should not be a possibility if we can actually decarbonize the world quickly enough. And that is such good news for all of us. And it's even good news for, for big oil companies who decide we're gonna reinvent our business and we're gonna become clean energy companies. Tony Lazarus, we've seen uh, the consequences recently of uh, a lack of basic civics education in this country. People don't live, learn civics anymore. And we've seen uh, the consequences of that. Question from a listener. Marty asks, is there any way to introduce some fundamental climate science into K-12 education? So tell us, what do people, students learn about the basics of climate around the country? Yeah, such a great question. So, uh, so first of all, let me just say that we have actually 
asked Americans about this, and they overwhelmingly, and I'm talking Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, support the teaching of uh, climate change and the causes and the consequences and solutions to our kids in K-12. So it is actually one of those areas where there's a, a very large social consensus that that would be a good thing. Um, more specifically, I mean, currently I think it's very patchy. Uh, there are certain parts of the country that are actually doing a pretty good job. They've incorporated climate change into not just science classes, but even into English classes and history classes and into the humanities. Um, so I think you will find some bright spots. But by and large, it's important to remember that the American education system is even more fragmented than our political system, right? Uh, we, there is no, like, we have a national education uh, department, but it does not control national education, not by a long shot, because education is still predominantly in the hands of local school boards, um, local PTAs, uh, and so on. Now, on the one hand, you can, you know, tear your hair out because it means that, that as a result, teaching of climate change can be so different in different parts of the country, though that's now changing because there is now a national science standards, which now for the first time includes climate change. So this will change uh, over, over the uh, coming years. And there's a really big effort right now by climate educators to get much better organized. And they're hoping in the next administration to really make a, a, a concerted push. And I think that's one of the areas where we all should be looking to, because that's, that's the deep fundamental cultural level change that is going to be needed for the long term. Um, but I would also just say this is, for all that fragmentation, it's also an incredible opportunity for everyday Americans to actually get involved and make a difference. Because while it may seem very difficult for most of us sitting at home to think, how am I going to convince the president to do something? It's much easier to say, I can just go show up at the local school board meeting. I can talk to my teachers, my kids' teachers. I can make a difference in my school district. And the more that happens, the more the entire system starts to change because there'll be more demand for textbooks, there'll be more demand for teaching and training, and it just starts to snowball uh, through, throughout the country. So don't underestimate your political power, even if it's at the local area. You Changing the way climate change is taught in the schools has ripple effects way beyond your own kid. Ed Maybach, we have a question from a listener to this live stream recording of Climate One. Bob Ward asks, what level of priority should the incoming Biden administration give to a just transition to a zero emissions economy such that workers in high carbon industries are retrained and redeployed? And that term just transition, we're here three white guys talking about this, often is termed as you know, people of color who've been harmed by the fossil fuel economy. Yeah, well, fortunately, they're they're according a just transition, a very high priority. The Biden administration's four top priorities are, are COVID, economic recovery, uh, racial equality, equity is the way they frame it, and climate change. And they recognize, and uh, both, both uh, President-elect Biden and, and Vice President-elect Harris uh, explicitly connect those four challenges, those four uh, uh, priorities. And they're smart to do so because in fact, the way in which we're going to make progress on all four is to link the four together. In Tony's and I, my research, we've actually identified that, um, that members of the public also feel really strongly about this point of a just transition. We cannot leave com individuals and communities behind who have helped drive the economic engine of America to get us to this point, even if we absolutely need them to change the way they earn a livelihood now. So this notion of a just transition is not something that, that pointy-headed academics or think tank personnel have, have dreamed up. It's something that actually is a pretty deeply held value in America and among Americans that we need to treat people fairly. And it's fair and square to make sure that those people the people who've earned their livelihood extracting and refining fossil fuels, that those people actually have a, a good livelihood going forward. Tony Lazowitz, the polling industry has taken some lumps recently after uh, some misses and in, in election cycles. And uh, it, it's one thing to ask people like what they support in the future. Do you support wind or solar renewables, et cetera, if there's no personal cost or consequence. So what happens when you ask people, how much are you willing to pay for you know, a transition away from fossil fuels where, where people actually have some skin in the game or there's actually some personal consequence. How does that shape their, their responses? 
Yeah, well, I'll go back to where we started this conversation, and that is that there is no single answer to that because there are different types of people. So mm -hmm. what we have found consistently is that, for example, the alarmed, they're actually very willing to, to spend like far more money on solving this problem than actually is going to cost. And, I, and then let's take a quick aside to recognize that the fundamental, one of at least one of the fundamental solutions here is shifting from the burning of fossil fuels, a 19th century technology, which still is digging stuff out of the ground and setting it on fire, to a 21st century energy system, which is harnessing the energy that is swirling around us at all times from the sun, from the wind, from the tides, from the heat in the ground, okay? Um, inexhaustible, renewable forever, and here's the key part, now cheaper than fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. That is a radically new situation and it is a story, it is a narrative, it's a communication opportunity because most Americans don't yet understand that. They still think they, they're totally on board for, climate, for clean energy, by the way. Again, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Um, but they still think that it's still you know, at least 10, 20 years away. And that's just not the case anymore. Uh, wind and solar, for example, are already cheaper than building a brand new uh, natural gas plant, let alone operating a coal-fired power plant all across the country and, in fact, around the world. So this isn't a, 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 any longer a question of you need to eat your vegetables. This is more like you get everything that you want, a healthier, cleaner environment, more jobs, uh, and you're going to pay less for your electricity. I mean, I got to say, what's not to like there? Okay. So... Uh, that's a story that most people don't yet fully understand. And that's, I think, going to be a critical part of the next couple of years. Because, again, back to what Ed was just saying, it's, imp it's so important that we also have this economic recovery because we are in the worst circumstances now economically since the Great Depression. And what was the fastest growing sector of the economy before COVID? The clean energy industry. Okay. This is a gargantuan, historic, like world shattering size transition. All the major transitions in human civilizational history have come through major advances in energy use, like going from using human muscle to the, to the, uh, to the harnessing of animal power, to harnessing fire, uh, to of course far, harnessing fossil fuels because Ed's right. In, in fact, let me just quickly say, I think one of the first things we need to do with workers in the fossil fuel industry, and I mean the workers, not necessarily the CEOs, is just to say, thank you. These are people who literally put yeah. their bodies on the line. And thinking of coal miners who would go in day after day and do some of the most dangerous, um, dirty, uh, uh, and personally killing like black lung disease kinds of jobs on behalf of all of us. They helped us create modern civilization. Now it's time to transition away from that dirty source of fuel, which has all these terrible consequences that we didn't fully understand when we started, but now we do. So let's start by just saying thank you. You are not the enemy, but we are going to be here as a society to help you make that transition with us. No, no man, no woman left behind. Um, I think that's just a different way of framing these issues that unfortunately I think we sometimes lose because people get so stuck suck into how do I, you know, is this punch counter punch uh, uh, kind of dynamic. Which is all the reward systems and incentives on social media and the villainization. A lot of the business models and campaigns of environmental groups are built on villainization of uh, companies and, and implicitly the workers uh, not on thank you. So that's a real sort of shift in tone for, uh, and that I think underneath that is that um, a lot of the Trump phenomenon is people, they feel judged. They feel like you're looking at me when I, because of what I eat or what I drive and you're judging me for my truck or for my steak, right? And, and saying that thank you and, and uh, moving back from judgment would be huge in this, in this country. And maybe back, do you think that's possible? Do you think that some of the, um, coastal elites could uh, could check their righteousness and their uh, judgment? Well, certainly Joe Biden is asking us to. And I, I think, you know, that was almost literally the first thing that came out of his mouth in his acceptance speech. Uh, and I think that was the exactly the right thing to come out of his mouth. That should be the top priority. I'm really concerned about how much animosity has been built into our social system. 
we not only don't trust each other anymore, to a very real degree, we hate each other. And we saw that at the Capitol last week. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't imagine a worse position for our country to be in than being, you know, in, intractably divided by our hatred for one another. But I, I you know, as I'm not sure that that hatred uh, occurred quickly. I think it brewed. Uh, you know, we, I think we, 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 there are multiple uh, reasons why that hatred was born and, and fomented. Um, I don't know how quickly we can walk away from it, but I am optimistic that we can put it behind us, especially if we make a, an effort to do so. We have to acknowledge it's there. Like, as you said earlier, we can't just pretend we're not in grief. We can't pretend that we don't hate each other. We have to acknowledge it and we have to find ways of trusting one another again, of, of loving one another again. Earlier on another episode of uh, Climate One, I spoke with Christine Todd Whitman and, and Chuck Hagel, two uh, national Republicans who thought that, uh, A, said that Joe Biden is the right man for this moment because he's a, he's a uh, you know, friendly guy who can uh, you know, um, be friends with people who he disagrees with and hope that he would lead us in that direction. Uh, Tony Weiswitz, I want to talk about the images that dominate uh, climate journalism. Tell us about, you know, if you if you ask people what comes to mind uh, if you say climate change and how that has been, uh, in, for played out in the media and shaped climate as something that's distant from us. Yeah. So one of the, my favorite questions that we've asked on these surveys over many, many years is what's the first thought or image that comes to mind when you hear the words global warming? Uh, and what often comes to many people's minds, in fact, it's very consistently at the top, is images of melting ice. Sea ice retreating on the Arctic Ocean, ice shells breaking off of Antarctica, melting glaciers around the world. Uh, and that's on the one hand, that's a useful thing because it does help uh, uh, in, uh, reinforce the sense that this is real because we all know from embodied experience, if you take a glass of, out, of ice outside on a hot summer day, what happens? The ice melts, right? I didn't have to teach you any physics any atmospheric chemistry, you understand in, in your, from your own experience exactly what warming temperatures does. So it's good at in reinforcing that it's real. The problem is how many of us live next to a melting glacier or in Antarctica or along the shores of the Arctic Ocean? Almost nobody, okay? And those are exactly the images that have been shown to us in the context of reporting on climate change over and over and over and over and over again. It's, I can't tell you how many times there have been articles, great articles written by excellent science journalists describing the latest finding or an impact and could have nothing to do with melting ice at all. And the editor says, hey, great article reporter. Hey, photo editor, get me a picture for climate change. And they slap a picture of a, of a melting iceberg on it, maybe with a polar bear. Okay, how many times have you seen that, that damn image uh, associated with the words global warming? Um, so unfortunately, those images are sometimes even more powerful than the words we read. And so we really have to be more careful, and it gets back to what I said before, of how important it is to put a human face on that, because most of those pictures of melting ice don't include a human being in those pictures at all. And this is ultimately about us. And that's what Donald Trump understands watching TV with uh, the sound off, that the, it's the power of the images, the images or what uh, he understands that better than most. Um, Ed Maybach, tell us about Ed Gandy and why he was a pioneer in climate communications. Yeah, Jim Gandy is his name. Jim um, Gandy. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm delighted to say he and I have become very close friends over the past 10 years. Uh, 10, 11 years ago now, actually, I put out a call to TV weathercasters around the country. And I asked for a volunteer, somebody who would work with me and my team to report on the local impacts of climate change in their community. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because um, as, as we've, Tony and I have both said, most members of the public accept the reality of climate change even 10 years ago, but they see it as, a, they tended to see it as a distant problem, distant in space, time and species. We, in Tony's and my very first survey, we learned something really surprising, which was that the public trusts TV weathercasters as a source of information about global warming. We followed that up with a survey of weathercasters and we wanted to know, well, would you be interested in, in teaching people about how 
global warming is changing conditions in your community. And we learned that about half of America's weathercasters said, yeah, I'd love to do that, but there are a whole bunch of reasons why I can't. So when I put out that call and Jim Gandy responded to that call, I wanted to work with one weathercaster to see if we couldn't solve those problems, overcome those barriers that were stopping him from educating his viewers about climate change. Jim, on, at the time, he's now retired. At the time, he was the chief meteorologist at WLTX in um, Columbia, South Carolina. I had other weathercasters volunteer from much more liberal or, or mixed media markets, but I chose Jim because he was really brave to, to want to talk about climate change on air in a really deep red media market like Columbia, South Carolina. And he had the support of his general manager and, and his news director to do so. So, you know, the news business is an economic business. They have to earn viewers, keep viewer loyalty if they want to keep the revenues coming into the station. So they did something really hard um, and they did it beautifully. Jim became really the first American TV weathercaster who was consistently going on air talking about human caused climate change and teaching his viewers about how it's changing conditions in their backyards. And they were rewarded for it rather than losing viewers, rather than being, um, you know, uh, essentially being uh, harassed into stop doing what they were doing. They actually earned viewers there over the first couple of years we worked with them. They went from third in the Nielsen ratings in Columbia to first in the Nielsen ratings. And that was a real accomplishment because not only were they doing the right thing, they were being rewarded for doing the right thing. And this is particularly remarkable because it spread and, and meteorologists, uh, weather men and women, were some of the most strident, um, I don't want to say deniers, but I, I guess skeptics, because they thought they, I don't know, they knew better or they, they, they knew the weather, right? And so they were some of the uh, most skeptical people. And, you know, they're one of the few people in this country that, that Republicans, the conservatives and liberals watch, you know, watch local sports, local weather. It's one of the few things we have in common in this country anymore. Yeah, that 10 years ago, when we first started this project, weathercasters on average were more skeptical of climate change than, than was the public. And, and, and I mean considerably more skeptical. Um, but over the next, uh, over the past 10 years, they have completely changed as a community. They are now almost to a person. They are on board accepting the reality of human-caused climate change. And as of today, almost half of TV weathercasters in America are part of the program that Jim Gandy helped us start. We call it the Climate Matters Program. And now, uh, last numbers I saw, we were almost at a thousand weathercasters who were participating in this program, which really means over the course of 10 years, that community has gone from being skeptical to not only being accepting, but to rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in doing what they can do to make sure that people in their community really understand what, what the conditions what's happening in their community and, and to a very real degree, understanding what their options are for responding to it. As we, as we wrap up here, um, we've been talking a lot about the motivations the perceptions of risk, uh, the social psychological dimensions, the how the problem is known, people accept the problem is known, the solutions are available, maybe that solutions are not as well communicated to people. Tony Leiserwitz, talk about personal agency. What is it and how can I get some? Yes. Well, it goes back to what I said before about stories. So uh, another example of that is uh, in terms of the implementation of the research insights that Ed and I have gathered is another program called Yale Climate Connections. And this is a, a national radio program that we sponsor. It's a brand new climate story every day that plays on over 650 stations across the United States. And it really is taking that idea of how do I hear about real people from every walk of life telling in their own voice, in their own uh, first person narratives, here's how climate change is affecting me as a mother, as a rancher, as a fisherman, as a restaurateur, as, you know, as a doctor, as a nurse. Um, and then even more importantly, the stories of people who are saying, I'm not gonna stand on the sidelines and watch the world burn. I'm gonna do what I can to get involved, roll up my sleeves and make a difference within my sphere of influence. And I will just say, as somebody who's been in this field for 30 plus years, I had no idea of the amount of incredible, creative, innovative, gritty things that people, Democrats and Republicans, by the way, uh, are doing all over this country to help address this problem. 
uh, and so back to your question about how do you deal with despair, I will say that Climate Connections is one of the best ways I know of to deal with despair because I'm so inspired by the stories that we're able to bring to the, a national audience about what all kinds of Americans are doing to help be part of the solution. Ned, Ned Maybach, uh, you come out of public health. How will climate affect, uh, you know, I've heard for a long time, you know, kids in the, in the emergency room with asthma, but that's that kind of meta thing that I can't quite grok. How, how do you say to someone climate could affect their personal health in their lifetime? Really bring it home, climate and personal health. So before I answer the question directly, let me say that Tony and I have learned over the years that, that um, when people do finally understand that climate change is personally relevant to them, they tend to um, connect it to, them, to things around them as opposed to them themselves. So mm -hmm. for example, when we ask people who tell us that they have personally experienced global warming, we ask them how, how have you experienced it? And people tend to give answers like here in the Washington area, um, I see my daffodils come up earlier in the spring, or I see the leaves changing uh, l later in the, in, in the fall. Um, so th they tend to talk their observations about the ways in which the climate is changing around them. It doesn't touch their lives directly. At least people aren't aware of that. But, but in reality, it is touching their lives directly. We know the, the people who are doing research on the ways in which climate change is, is harming human health, they've actually identified eight different categories of ways in, in which we are being harmed. The most dramatic of which is through dangerous weather. Climate, climate change is making our weather more dangerous. Um, bigger storms, more, more serious, hotter and, and more protracted heat waves. And in both of those instances, people get hurt or they die. Um, another way in which the climate, uh, changing climate is harming our health is the fact that our ecosystems are being disrupted, which creates opportunities for what we in public health call vectors, mosquitoes, ticks, rodents, to spread, to go into new places and to carry new diseases with them into new places. Um, so these are two of the, the, are three of the many ways in which climate change is harming human health. And what Tony and I have learned is that when you take the time to explain to people that in fact, climate change is causing health harm and equally of equal importance that climate solutions are good for our health, climate solutions are health solutions, it creates an opportunity for people to recognize that their real skin in the game is quite literally their skin. Um, and that's a really important realization because it takes people to a deeper level of understanding about what's really at, at risk and a deeper level of understanding about the point Tony made earlier, which is, wow, we can have a, a twofer here. We can do the right thing for our climate. And in doing so, we'll get cleaner air. If, as we clean up our fuel supplies, we'll get cleaner air, cleaner water, and better health. And we don't have to wait for those benefits. Those benefits occur almost instantaneously to the extent to which we clean up our fuel supplies. And they also happen locally. So if me and my neighbors decide to become advocates to close down the fossil, the uh, coal power plant in our, uh, in our county, we benefit immediately. We get cleaner air, cleaner water, and better health. We don't have to wait for the benefits of stabilizing our climate. So this whole notion of for people who are whose minds are open to give them this whole new narrative to share with them this whole narrative, which is entirely science-based. The evidence is perfectly clear, but most people have never heard that evidence. But when we, we know that when we do share that with them, it has real value and it has value to people across the political continuum, which is a particularly helpful uh, finding from our research because it's one of those conversations that conservative Americans are really interested in having. They have, just like most of their liberal counterparts, they haven't heard about this. And sometimes they're skeptical about the climate benefits, but they are rarely skeptical about the health benefits of cleaning up our energy supplies. Thank you both. It's really been an honor to speak with both of you. Now it's time to present Ed and Tony with a 10th annual Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. I met with Steve in 2007 after I went to the Arctic on a life-changing expedition with some scientists and journalists, and he explained climate to me. And um, 
as we heard earlier, uh, presented his last book, Science as a Contact Sport, came to Climate One. And in July of 2010, uh, was hosting a program uh, with Joe Rohn from Climate Progress in San Francisco. And Steve had planned to attend after flying into San Francisco and coming up uh, to San Francisco. And he wrote to me a few days before saying, sorry, I can't make it to the dinner. I'm not in good health and I've got to stop burning the candle at both ends and in the middle too. And when I was hosting that event, I learned that Steve died on a, the plane ride back from Europe attending a conference and was quite upset and crushed and, and as were other people. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, I was having dinner with Larry Goulder, who was a Stanford professor and a colleague, uh, played guitar with, with Steve. And I thought I'd like to do something and perhaps create an award in his honor. And I very vividly remember Larry looking at me like, you know, you weren't Steve's student, you weren't even a Stanford student. Who are you? And, and you know, do you, are, who's this kid who wants to like do this award? I remember kind of swirling his glass of red wine, sort of looking at me skeptically. I was able to convince him and Paul Ehrlich and some other people supported it. And we raised, uh, started doing it 10 years ago. And it's been, going for 10 years, the 15 now, $15,000 award to phenomenal communicators in natural or social science. Um, and it's very befitting that Ed and Tony are the 10th annual recipients. So to do the honors, it's my pleasure to welcome a member of the Schneider Award jury, Christine Russell. She's an award-winning journalist and senior fellow in the Environment and Natural Resources Program at Harvard Kennedy School. Chris, over to you. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, that was really a great conversation, and uh, there's always something for us to learn. It's my great pleasure to officially present the 2020 Stephen H. Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. The, as you've been talking about, the award honors the late Steve Schneider, father of climatology, and an outstanding science and climate communicator. As a science journalist at the Washington Post in the 1980s, I was fortunate to get to know Steve very well. He was universally respected for his uncanny ability to talk in a common sense way to the general public. And he was really a journalist's dream to interview. Today, of course, it's more important than ever to have scientists equipped to talk clearly about the climate crisis and bring home the urgent need to curb carbon emissions, and having a well-informed public is crucial to fighting climate denial and resistance. And I think that the, the Snyder Award has helped recognize and really encourage better climate communication within the scientific community to the public. Uh, in this, the 10th award, as we've discussed, we honor two scientists whose public opinion research has helped us and helped me as a journalist understand what the American and global public think about climate change. Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz, director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, and Dr. Ed Maybach, director of the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, a mouthful, both of those, have created the gold standard in public opinion and polling and spread the word widely about their findings. And like many in the media, I've long been an avid follower of their joint polling project, Climate Change in the American Mind, now in its 12th year. And as we discussed today, it is really encouraging to show the growing support for climate change action and to show and measure the strong shift in the American public toward more alarm and concern and away from doubt and denial. I want to congratulate Tony and Ed. They will make brief remarks, starting with Tony, who's also going to show us the trophy. Uh, even though this is virtual, they have already received their awards. Thank you so much, Tony. And as you can see, it's a crystal ball. So you know our ability to forecast elections and everything has dramatically improved. Um, so let me just first of all say thank you so much to Climate One and the jury. I mean, it's such an honor to win this award as well as, you know, especially one named uh, and, and held after the great Steven Schneider, who, as I said before, was such a, an inspiration to me in my early career. 
um, and to become part of a team or a, a collection of amazing scientists and communicators who have previously won this award, many of whom are my heroes that I have been, you know, learning from and being inspired by for many, many years. Um, secondly, I just need to say thank you to my my research spouse uh, and dear friend and colleague, uh, Ed Maybach. Uh, we found each other over a dozen years ago, and it's been such an incredible journey ever since. We certainly had no idea what we were getting started. Um, but even more importantly, I want to really take a moment to thank my staff and Ed's staff We have uh, and our team. We have had such a pleasure and such a privilege to work with some of the smartest people on the planet who have come into this field from master students and undergraduate students to PhD students to postdocs to the staff that actually make these things possible. I, I think it's fair to say it really does take a village to raise two good scientists. Um, and so uh, really so much of this uh, uh, honor goes to them. And then last, I just wanna say thank you to the climate community in all of its breadth and diversity around the world. Uh, when Ed and I got started on this, it was a much smaller community, uh, especially around good communication. It has grown tremendously in the past dozen years. And I just wanna say a big thank you to all of you who have adopted and implemented our scientific insights here in the US and around the world in the effort to build public and political will for climate action. You know, it's one of the great privileges as a scientist is to actually have an audience of people who aren't scientists who actually pay attention to what you say. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thanks. Ed? Okay, Tony's just proved that that we are in fact truly a research couple um, in the sense that the, the comments that I prepared are almost exactly the comments that Tony just delivered. So nicely said, Tony, that was really great. Uh, so let me, let me thank Climate One and the jury for selecting us. It really was an incredible thrill. Um, one of the writers at my university asked me last week, well, how do I, what does this mean to me? And, uh, and I, and how do you feel about it? And I have to say, it took me a little while to figure that out. I'm not particularly in tune with my emotions, um, but uh, having a week to think it through, uh, you know, I, I, I clearly have a set of emotions. I, I feel incredibly humbled by this, humbled in the sense that, um, as Tony said, the past winners are, are my heroes, every last one of them. I've only met uh, seven out of the, the, the nine past winners, but all nine of them are, are my heroes. All nine of them in a very real sense are my mentors. I've learned so much from all of them. Some of them have been very generous with me and in teaching me personally. Others have just been very generous with all of us and I've learned by their public actions. Um, and I'm, I'm humbled to just be a member of the, that, that group of such incredible people. Um, I'm also incredibly grateful, grateful for the people that I get to work with, grateful for my amazing team and Tony's amazing team. Um, and really grateful for the opportunity for us to work together to help create a new science, the science of climate communication. It's a science, you know, I don't know that we could put a, a birth date to it, but it's a, you know, it is a science that didn't exist all that long ago. And we've had the opportunity to work together um, to help to define that science. And it, um, and as Tony said, it's a science that is rapidly drawing lots of more exciting, brilliant, uh, innovative, thinkers and, and doers into the community. And so I'm just incredibly grateful to be part of all of that, um, including these some of these communities of practice that I've had the opportunity to work with, like America's TV Weathercasters. 12 years ago, I, I knew nothing about TV Weathercasters. And today I'm happy to say I'm sort of an honorary member of the, of, of the Weathercaster community in America. And that feels really good. I'm really grateful for them to trust me that when I said I'd like to work, but when my colleagues and I said, we'd like to work with you to help you do something that half of you said you'd like to do, they trusted me. They took, took me at my word. And it, it's really been a remarkable um, a, a remarkable opportunity to, to do something that, that we never would have been able to do um, had they not been so gracious. And the same is true for conservative Americans. We have a program that my colleague, Bob Inglis, a former Republican member of Congress runs, and he's, he has uh, brought me into contact with and dialogue with really wonderful respect-based dialogue with conservative Americans all over the country who do wanna talk about climate change, who do believe their party is the party of ideas and that to be on the wrong side of climate science, bad for the party, bad for the country, bad for the world. And I feel really privileged as a 
San Francisco liberal, formerly a San Francisco liberal, now uh, now an East Coast liberal. Um, but I feel incredibly privileged to have been part of those conversations. Um, and the climate justice community, a community of that we have built a team around. They have taught me so much around how about where, even though I am trained in public health, and even though. Um, uh, health disparities and the, the notion of we, we are at, we are professionally obligated to make sure that the most burdened are the first served. So I was, my DNA as a public health professional, it's part, it's in there, but the clim members of the climate justice community over the past couple of years, the past year in particular, have really helped me understand where my own blinders were. And I'm just so grateful for them to, for helping educated me in that way. And then my own community, health professionals, they, we have started something absolutely wonderful in the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. Um, the last thing it's made me feel is just, I appreciate how lucky I am, how lucky I am. We're, we're not through this pandemic yet, but thus far my family, my team, we have all come through it reasonably unharmed. I hope that it will be continue to be the case. I know it isn't the case for so many people. 4,400 Americans dead yesterday from COVID alone. Um, so I'm incredibly, I recognize how fortunate I am and I feel incredibly lucky. Um, and then just last point I wanna make about again, being lucky, Come, the question that Greg asked earlier about, well, how do you manage that anxiety, that fear, that depression that can come on you from working on an issue like climate change, staring it in the face every day? I feel so incredibly lucky to be part of a team of people who we can demonstrably say we are making a difference because that allows me to focus on the difference we are making as opposed to the enorm, which is something that we can manage, we control, as opposed to the enormity of the problem. And as I manage my own anxieties, my own fear, um, by doing the work, it allows us, it allows me and my team to actually make a contribution and be useful. And there is nothing better in life than being useful. So thank you for that recognition. Thank, thank you, Boom. Thank you all for joining us to honor these two gentlemen scholars in memory of Steve Schneider. I'd like to thank the jury, uh, Chris Russell, Naomi Reskies, and Marshall uh, Shepherd. This podcast of this program will be available and published in a couple of weeks and video will be posted on Climate One's YouTube page. Thanks to our online audience, a lot of esteemed people. I wish we uh, could see you in the room. We look forward to seeing you in the room at the Commonwealth Club um, for the next award. Um, so see you next time, everybody. Thanks for joining us.